Henry Dixon Taylor Jr. and Colette Green Taylor have 90 years worth of life lessons and priceless wisdom with a lot of laughs along the way. Their lives are stories of what they value most, family, faith, love, hard work, fun, and service. So let's start from the beginning. Two people with two very different upbringings. Henry, known his whole life as Hank, entered the world on February 27, 1931 in Provo, Utah. Hank's parents, Henry Dixon Taylor Sr. and Alta Hanson Taylor, welcomed their first of four sons in the middle of the Great Depression. At age two, Hank's father bought a piece of land on the Provo mountainside with no modern conveniences, no water, no electricity, no roads, making for a very adventurous childhood. His only neighbors were his cousins who lived a quarter mile away. The chances for social activity were, were pretty limited. My, my cousins were the closest possibility and both of my cousins, uh, the one just older than I am and then the one my same age and the one younger, were, were very bookish. So anyway, to attract them into the kind of activities I was interested in, uh, it was a hard job. At the time, Hank preferred baseball to books and dreamt of becoming a major league player. So he spent his hard-earned money on a very nice mitt. I sent away and I was so thrilled when it came. It was a great ball glove. And uh, then I realized I had no one to play with very much. And uh, so my mother would come out and throw to me sometimes. But strangely enough, she threw like a girl. And it was a little bit uh, unchallenging, I guess, to say the best. My father was really busy and I think I remember playing catch with him twice in my life and that was how busy he was. Anyway, I tried to convince my cousins that they should come out and play with me and they, they were not very interested in, in that sort of thing. And so finally I, I took some of my savings and I told them I'd pay them all something if, if they would come and play a ball with me. I had carved out a field in a big alfalfa field and had made bases and anyway, we had one ball game out, out there and that, that was it for ball games. As Hank got older, he joined the school baseball team and finally had teammates to play with. While growing up though, Hank describes gravity as his most reliable friend. I found that if I went about halfway up the mountain, uh, it was a very steep mountain, at least a 45 degree angle down to the valley. It was fun to go up there and just roll rocks down the mountain. The rocks would go down and they'd crash through the oak brush and through the sagebrush. And when, if that rock would hit another rock, it would basically split, crack and explode almost. And so I could dream that I was a bombardier in World War II and bombing the, the fields below with these big rocks crashing down the mountain. So anyway, uh, in the winter time, there was sleigh riding, and you could go down that mountain just 100 miles an hour. It was just wonderful. And so anyway, I guess uh, gravity was really my playmate. While Hank was exploring the great outdoors, Colette was inside playing make-believe with her cousins during extreme Canadian weather. Colette Green was born in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada on April 13, 1933 to her parents Thomas Nalder Green and Cora Jane Johnson. Her ancestors, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, traveled by covered wagon from Utah and Arizona to Alberta, Canada. They sought free homesteads that were available to those willing to farm the land. This was not easy in the harsh Canadian climate, but Colette has fond memories of her childhood, surrounded by church members and extended family. I grew up in a small city called Lethbridge. All of southern, it was southern Alberta. All of southern Alberta really is, uh, the economy is based on wheat. Um, everybody in one way or another is connected to the farming of wheat. My dad was a chemist for a flour mill. One of the tests that he did was he actually baked two little loaves of bread at the end of every day. And then he cut them in half, opened them up to see the texture and color of the bread. And that was one of the tests. But we got to have the bread afterward. So every day he would bring home these two cute little loaves of bread. But because they were cut in the middle to see what they were like, 
I grew up thinking that the only parts of the bread that were edible was the part in the middle because my mother would take a few slices and throw the rest away because we got more the next day. When we got married, I still believed that the only part of the bread that was any good was in the middle. So we were living on a very tiny budget when we first got married. He came home and looked in the garbage can and said, what are you doing throwing away the bread? I said, well, we, we ate the good part. <laughs> They spent most of their days indoors, and their basements became their playgrounds. If you grow up where I did in Canada, you don't go outdoors. Outdoors is harsh. It's either a dust storm, or an ice storm, or a blizzard, or the wind is blowing so hard you can hardly stand up. You don't go outside any more than you absolutely have to. So we would create things in a basement, like we would create it to be a prison and we would be prison guards and our dolls were the prisoners and or we would be aircraft flyers in world war ii and we would create wooden airplanes and we're driving you know in a dog fight i mean you do all these creative games in the basement because that's where you play <laughs> and so i remember childhood as being all kinds of creations that we created for ourselves in basements Colette was an only child, but both her parents came from large families. Her mother was one of 12, and her father, one of eight, which for Colette meant a lot of cousins. So even though I was an only child, had a lot of cousins that were very like sisters and brothers. So it was fun. We had a really good time. Colette's mother worked as a bank receptionist and a secretary for most of her life. I didn't really want to follow that example, although I think she was very happy Having been raised on a farm in a very small little farmhouse with 12 kids, I think to be in the city and have a job to go to every day and dress up to look really nice, I think she loved that. My mother was a beautiful lady. She, every time I would meet anyone, the typical saying was, oh yes, your mother is really cute. <laughs> but uh, she was, and she was absolutely very sweet. My dad was the one that I felt closest to because he did the things that I grew to love. He loved sports of all kinds. He was elected to the local sports hall of fame. He played all the sports. And then when I was growing up, he was the announcer at the hockey games and the baseball games. And I would go with him to all of the games. And uh, so I grew up loving sports. He also was a good singer. He was a, in a quartet that had a radio show. I'd listen to him sing on the radio in the evening, and he competed with this wonderful quartet. He was always in plays and musical productions, which I always went to the rehearsals. I would learn everything at the rehearsals, and I became, as a child, a prompter because I would memorize the whole thing. <laughs> anyway, so the things that he did to me were the most fun things, and I think that influenced me to like lots and lots of things and to be a participant in many things. Just as Colette's parents had a great impact on her life, Hank remembers the positive attributes of his father and mother that he wants to pass down to his posterity. I think the things that I remember most about my father and would be characteristics that I tried to maintain and would pass on to the kids was that he was a very faithful, service-oriented kind of person. He gave a lot of his time and energy to the church, and th that was a very big thing in his life. His father also set a good example in being wise with his money, and Hank describes his mother as a great hostess and an incredible cook. She had lots of friends and a great entertainer, and I remember trying to sleep as a child when friends were in and the house was just shaking with laughter or the people were having a good time. And I, I didn't appreciate that at the time, but I know now that's a great, great thing to have happen. Hank learned the meaning of hard work as a young child. His chores ranged from taking care of chickens and shoveling coal for the furnace to burning unwanted trash and... The other one which came every eight days and four hours was to go up and get water to come down the ditch so that we could fill the cisterns so that we'd have water for my house and my uncle's house down the road. Early on in life, he started earning money. His first job was picking fruit. 
was easy to get a job picking cherries and it was easy to get a job picking strawberries. So I do that. You'd, you'd uh, work really hard for a day in the hot sun and you, you could end up with a couple of dollars at the end of the day. And so that was a, a good deal. Hank's most consistent job was at Dixon Taylor Russell Company, his family's furniture business. He started out emptying trash cans and worked his way up to the upholstery shop. I had the opportunity to learn how to upholster chairs and for a period of time also I worked in the repair shop where things would be broken and needed to be glued back together or repaired in some way. So I spent uh, a year or so in the furniture repair shop also. And that, that job lasted pretty much all the way until I went away to, uh, to Harvard and uh, working in that furniture store. And that was uh, a pretty steady job and one that I had all through high school and all through college. I basically paid for my tuition and schooling expense, except I lived at home, so my parents actually bore part of the expense. I remember going to a pre-induction physical at the time of the Korean War. I was in college. They said because I had asthma, I was going to be rejected. And, uh, and they sent me to a room for counseling because of being rejected from the Army. And uh, so the counselor said, Oh, you're disabled. We, we will basically pay your tuition for you. The state will. And I said, well, that's nice of you, but I don't need that. And, and so I said, you keep the money and give it to someone who needs it more than I do. And uh, so I, I think there just is a sense of independence and not having to be uh, dependent on others for support is, was, a, was a strong sense that I have. On May 26, 1949, Hank graduated from Brigham Young High School. After graduation, without even applying, he enrolled in classes at nearby Brigham Young University. It was a lot different than today, where, where there's, what, 25, 26,000 students. When I, when I went to BYU and started my classes, 2,000 people. And I basically knew everyone on campus. I could recognize them or knew them by name in many cases. It was a smaller but a fun school. And just a lot of good people were there. Uh, just some of my lifelong friends came from that BYU experience. In 1951, Colette also made her way to BYU. She followed in her cousin's footsteps and left Alberta, Canada for Provo, Utah. Her roommate and best friend, Jerry, helped shape her positive college experience. But what really made the difference was my good friend that I went to school with who was a fabulous person. I mean, she was one of these, um, one of a kind, really. She was amazing. And when we got there, I said, what are we going to do? Well, now that we're here, unpacked our bags, now what? She said, now we're going to do everything. And I said, what do you mean by that? She said, we're gonna join everything you can join. We're gonna volunteer for everything you can volunteer for. And we'll find out where the fun people are. <laughs> so that's what we did. And uh, we had amazing experiences because she just pushed me to go along with her and do as much as we could possibly. And we did, we met all the great people at school, had great experiences. So it was great. Colette says she watched all of her older cousins attend BYU for a few years and then get married. So I didn't give much thought to what to major in. I thought I was just going to go and have a good time and then get married. <laughs> and uh, so I just took a lot of interesting classes. I thought for a while I would be a doctor. I took pre-med classes. thought for a while I'd be an archaeologist. I thought, you know, it was just, I was just having a good time. Long about junior year, I realized, oh my goodness, I might have to graduate. I, I better do something real. <laughs> and uh, so I started preparing to be a teacher uh, with an art minor and a French minor and uh, ended up graduating in education. While Colette worked toward her degree, her religious conversion also took shape. All of my family and aunts and uncles were very, very strong in the church. So I kind of just grew up accepting everything I heard about. We went to church every Sunday. It seemed like mostly the things I heard about were that 
being in the church was the best way to live. That if you lived all the commandments and did all the things you were told, your life would be happy. At BYU, you had to take a religion class. And so when I first got there, I was in a, a religion class. I think it was the Book of Mormon. And almost the first week, our teacher said, who knows what the atonement is? And would you believe not one person in the class held their hand up? And the teacher was uh, dumbfounded. He said, I can't believe it. You all are members of the church and not one of you knows what the atonement is when that is the single most important thing about our faith. And I was astounded. And so he had us read the Book of Mormon, all the parts related to the atonement. And that really, I think, was my conversion. At this time, Hank was also growing spiritually by serving a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the Western Canadian Mission. On December 5, 1950, he entered the mission home in Salt Lake City and was set apart by Elder Ezra Taft Benson. He was Canada-bound eight days later. Hank credits serving a mission amidst the start of the Korean War to his father's intuition and encouragement. My father said, you know, if you're going to get out on a mission, you probably better go pretty quickly because the, with the war situation changing, the draft is going to pick up and you may not have the opportunity if you don't go soon. I said, well, look, I've got about a month's worth of schooling to complete the quarter. He said, well, talk, talk to your teachers and see what you can work out. And so he did. Hank left earlier on his mission than he had originally planned to. And turns out it was just in time. I have to thank my father's foresight because it was just a month. Well, it was probably one or two missionary sessions later that no one else could go. The, the draft had really cut it off and, and uh, everyone was having to go into the service and could not serve missions. So I was one of the last ones to get out before the, the draft took everyone. And, uh, so that was a great experience, and I, I'm grateful that I, I got to serve the mission. And in Canada was a good thing. On his mission, Hank was a leader and served as a district president over missionaries and members on Vancouver Island from June to December of 1952. While he was helping others come unto Christ, his heart was also changing. When I went as, as a young man, I, I was uh, pretty self-centered, I'd have to say. The process of being a missionary and getting to meet a lot of other people and see the challenges and, and problems that they faced and the opportunities that they failed to take advantage of really gave me a perspective for life that was just marvelous. And also the process of being close to the Lord and finding out personally for myself that the church is true and that the gospel had been restored was a valuable thing that has served me all my life. I would encourage both the young men and young women in our family to, to serve missions. It's such a great learning experience and it's such a great way to get a perspective on life. Back in Provo, now that Colette had figured out her major, she decided to focus on finding the right guy to marry. Just figured it had to be someone who was fabulous. I'd never had any problem with boyfriends. I always thought I would have my choice. Um, didn't really concern me, except by the time I was a junior, I thought it's probably time to start narrowing the field. Yeah, but I was just looking for someone who was really great. After two years in the mission field, Hank returned to BYU in 1953. Colette describes seeing him for the very first time. I was at the field house at BYU in the bleachers watching some kind of a show. And I was with another guy, obviously. And he said, look down about 30 rows. You see that guy with the flaming red hair? And I said, yeah. And he said, he is the greatest guy I know. He just got back from a mission and we've already elected him president of our social unit. And he, is, he went on and on about how great this guy was. I immediately thought, I've got to meet him. The same fellow that was sitting with her in the field house was touring her around. She was elected to be queen of the snow carnival at BYU. And so he was the royal escort in taking her around. I was working on a snow sculpture out in the uh, quad area at BYU. And uh, 
he, in, he introduced me to her, and that was the first time I had ever seen her. And uh, she, I found out that she was a Canadian, and her home was really basically in the area where my mission was. And so we had kind of a common bond, and so I talked to her a little bit, and then uh, later asked her for a date, and she went out with me, so that was good. But she was a, she was a hot number also, <laughs> and so it, it was kind of difficult to get on her schedule. And uh, came, came time for the junior prom, and uh, she said, who are you gonna go with? She was kind of going with one of my good friends at the same time. Uh, then her new roommate said, you know, it really is Hank's turn. <laughs> so I, I got to go to the junior prom with her. On their first date, Hank really swept Colette off her feet. She was living in one of the family life units at BYU. These were very nice facilities. They had a nice lobby area that you could go into, and there were, there were several corridors off of that where there were housing residents. Well, it came time to pick her up, and I was waiting in the lobby. She came out and had on new shoes, I guess, and she slipped and fell flat on her back. <laughs> and from her back, she didn't lose her poise at all. She just said, hi. <laughs> and so from there, we, we went to our, our first date. The couple focused on getting to know one another, so their first kiss faded into a distant memory. I don't remember. I really don't, I really do not remember. I, it seems like most of our dates were doing things and talking, mm -hmm. and I frankly don't remember a first kiss. Maybe you do. Isn't that funny? I, I'm not, I'm not totally sure, but I, <laughs> I, I, I have the vague recollection that it was after one of our dates, after we'd been out a few times, and it was at the doorstep, and I kissed her goodnight. And uh, I'm, I'm sure it was a wonderful thing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pretend it was a wonderful, memorable event. <laughs> Hank made a lasting impression on Colette. I think initially I was impressed because all the other guys that I knew thought he was great. So I trusted their opinion initially, thought if they think he's great, he must be great. And then uh, the more I got to know him, I realized that really he had a deep down integrity Aside from, from really loving life, he loved to do everything. So, uh, as a child, he grew up out in the sticks, and yet he taught himself to ski and do all these things. I mean, he really went for it and uh, liked to do everything. And I thought, in all aspects, very admirable kind of person and fun. And Hank knew Colette was special right away. I think that the thing that was most attractive is that she just had a great sense of humor and was fun to be with. That was really the most attractive part. Later I found that she had many other fine qualities and uh, skills and it was, uh, it was easy to fall in love with her. After the junior prom, I knew that Colette was the one that I wanted to be with and I gave her my pin and that was a uh, commitment, it was engagement to be engaged. So it was probably through that summer that uh, we, we dated and had just a wonderful time. And uh, at that, toward the end of that uh, summer time, Colette wanted to have the talk. And uh, so she, she asked, what does it mean to be pinned? And so I told her it means that we're ready to be engaged. And she said, well, you're going away to school at, after this next year. Are you gonna go by yourself? And I said, nope. And so uh, we, we started to make plans then to, to, to set a date, get a ring, all that sort of thing. That, that was uh, kind of the, the pivotal point. Colette enrolled in summer school to be with Hank and to make sure this wedding was really going to happen. So I enrolled in summer school, and that was an amazing summer where I really learned a lot about him. <clears throat> One, I knew he liked to golf. I took a golfing class. I was terrible at it. He liked to play tennis. I took a tennis class. I was terrible at it. He liked to hike mountains. So I went with him to the top of Timpanogos. Coming down, I was so slow that we were about the last ones up there 
So on our way down, there was a horrible avalanche. Uh, rocks broke off from the top, the size of refrigerators, and came rolling down. It was a very serious situation. I found out he really had skills. I would have run straight down. He grabbed me, pulled me straight across because he knew that rocks coming down the mountain have a fall line. And you don't run in front of a rock and win. You go this way. He saved our lives. Hank was on the same page and proposed to Colette. He says it was a simple engagement, different than what you see today. When our grandchildren and our children got engaged, it was a big production. Uh, I remember Brigham uh, took his uh, girlfriend to a special restaurant, and I think when the dessert came out, it was ice cream or a cake or something, the ring was in the cake, and it was a big, big deal. Another one took his girlfriend up to the mountain cabin. He said, I need your help getting the chainsaw out. And the ring was on the chainsaw. <laughs> and uh, I guess I just don't have the romance in my soul that, that, that our grandkids and kids have had. And so when, when it came time to present the ring and make you know, the final deal of the engagement, uh, I, I went up to Canada at Christmas time, which was a pretty good journey to get there. And uh, the time that I presented the ring to her was just a little bit before Christmas, and I met her in the kitchen. The, the ironing board was out to one side, and she came out in her robe, and I gave her the ring. <laughs> and uh, not, not too colorful, but, but memorable at least. The two made it official, and on March 18, 1955, Hank and Colette were married sealed for time and all eternity in the Salt Lake City Temple. Colette remembers getting ready early that morning in her college dorm room for the big day. I had a mirror this size trying to fix my hair. It was kind of stressful and it was five in the morning. And because the plan was my parents would pick us up, me up, drive to the foot of the hill, he would come down the hill with his parents, we would caravan to Salt Lake. Well. We get to the bottom of the hill. I saw their car come down. I anxiously looked to make eye contact with him. He wouldn't even look at me. And I thought, oh my goodness, he's changed his mind. All the way up to Salt Lake, I could see the back of his head in the car in front of me. And he never turned around, never smiled. And I was sure he had changed his mind. When we got there, he'd say, let's, let's not do this. But he was thinking, that uh, I'd, I'd been told always that it's not appropriate to look at the bride before the <laughs> wedding. And uh, so I was careful to avoid staring at her prematurely. So by the time we got into the ceiling room, I was angry with him anyway, a little annoyed. And then to get married, you hold hands across the altar. I looked down, he had on a white shirt frayed all around the cuff. And then I looked across and his collar was frayed. I thought, another signal, he doesn't want to get, he's worn his worst shirt for the wedding. But what happened, why? Uh, what happened, I got up early in the morning also and I was uh, sleeping in the guest room, not, not my own bedroom. And uh, it turns out that in, in that guest room, that my father kept his work shirts. And I had a, a very nice shirt, a brand new one with French cuffs and, and uh, it was uh, wonderful. And uh, so I put it on in the morning. It was dark in the morning. My brother was asleep in the room and so I did all the dressing with the lights out. And when I, I didn't know until after the wedding that it was the frayed old work shirt. And, my father just wore so many white shirts that his, uh, when he wore them out, those would be his work shirts. And, and, and he I, put them in that closet. And it turned out it was the identical brand with the identical French cuffs, and, uh, but it was frayed and worn. <laughs> so, anyway, right after the wedding ceremony, Colette says, we have a little trip to make. And she took me across the street over to ZCMI and uh, made, made me buy a new shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I had a change of shirts before we went on the rest of the day. And uh, I, I met a, an old uh, friend in, in the store 
and, and I was going to introduce him. I said, uh, uh, Jim, this is my wife. <laughs> because we, and it was a, kind of the first realization that I was officially married and I had a wife. While we were buying a shirt. <laughs> yeah. Very funny day. And the laughs didn't stop there. During the marriage ceremony, as Elder Harold B. Lee performed the ceiling, Colette says the apostle got a little confused as to Hank's name. His name is Henry Dixon Taylor Jr. His father and all his siblings had a big, well-known furniture store called Dixon Taylor Russell. And everybody knew of that store. So uh, Harold B. Lee, who was a, an apostle, married us. And he knew, knew about the store. So the cadence was just the same. So he says, and do you take Henry Dixon Taylor Russell to be your, <laughs> what do I say? Do I marry a furniture store or start right out with this ceremony saying no? <laughs> Fortunately, there's a kind of a snicker through, through the people who are in the ceiling room with us. And uh, pre presently, elderly at that time said, I think I've done something wrong. I don't, don't know what it is, but I, I'm just going to start over and do that part again. So he went through it again carefully and he got Henry Dixon Taylor Jr. Yep. She could say yes. Three months after their wedding, the newlyweds graduated from BYU. Hank with a degree in business management with minors in English and geology, and Colette with a degree in education and a minor in art. The university president, Ernest L. Wilkinson, spoke at their graduation ceremony, and Colette claims he was very persuasive with his words. And he said to all of us, at this point in time, the people in the world that are having large families are not that well equipped to raise large families. He says, you guys are. You're all graduating from university. There's nobody who's in a better position to have a large family and do a good job of it than you. We all paid attention. And we and almost all of our friends who graduated had big families. <laughs> <laughs> I owe it all to Ernest L. Wilkinson. <laughs> Hank and Colette took the advice to heart and got right to work. A few months later, they found out Colette was pregnant with their first child, making their cross-country drive to graduate school very memorable. It was quite a trip because everywhere we stopped, we'd have lunch and I would throw up. We'd have breakfast and I would throw up. We'd have supper and I would throw up. <laughs> In August of 1955, the young couple, soon to be parents, moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts, so Hank could attend Harvard Business School. When I was in my junior year, I decided that I would probably like to get an MBA. And I said, there's three schools I'd like to consider. One is Stanford, one is Harvard, and one is Northwestern. Those, those at that time were the three top schools. He was accepted into all three, but ultimately chose Harvard because they offered financial aid. It's kind of hard to realize that I was actually there, that I was that actually been accepted. And uh, we, it, we spent uh, years in Boston, lo loved the time there, just loved it. But Colette admits it was a tough time for many reasons. We had no phone, no money, no car, no way to do anything. And Hank was busy in school all the time. And I was pregnant and feeling sick. So, you know, it was not a good time. <laughs> She says the people made the place. Our group of friends was an education in itself, just to get to know them and enjoy them. And they all went on to do great things. Especially when their living space was less than ideal. Living in a top floor, one room, on the third floor of about the oldest house in Cambridge. Really, seriously, there was a house two doors away that had a sign in front that said, the oldest house in Cambridge. <laughs> We shared an electrical outlet with the next room, and we shared a bathroom with everyone on the floor. <laughs> it was, that was interesting. You, you could be sitting at the table and could reach in the kitchen and reach the stove, the refrigerator, and the sink. Without just getting out by of your reaching chair. around like this, without <laughs> getting out. And, yeah, and was... the bed was right behind us, and, and uh, that, that was it. While pregnant, Colette worked at a children's store in Harvard Square, and Hank went to class. The two prepared to meet their first child the upcoming spring. 
Colette describes her first labor and delivery experience in an old maternity hospital. So we decided that at the first labor pain, I probably better get there because we'd have to rely on friends to drive us there. That turned out to be a kind of a bad mistake because I was in labor in that charity hospital for two and a half days before the baby arrived. But all that time was labor. And I was in a room with 16 other women waiting to have babies and they were all screaming. I mean, it really was a snake pit. They were screaming and yelling. I said to a nurse, aren't you going to help them? She says, no, <laughs> there's nothing we can do. So it was that sort of place. Uh, an intern would come in and say, well, I'm on duty, I'll, I'll deliver your baby. Seven hours later, another one would come in and say, well, now I'm on duty, I'll deliver your baby. Seven hours later, another one would come in. <laughs> By the time I had it, they'd given up on me and they just knocked me out with some kind of anesthetic. I didn't even know I'd had a baby until a day later. And Hank saw the baby before I did. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it was not a good experience. And I vowed at the time, never have another child. Never, never, no, no more, that's it, <laughs> we're done, <laughs> yeah. And, and she didn't for 17 months. <laughs> <laughs> In just more than a year, the Taylors married, graduated from college, and moved across the country away from family so Hank could attend grad school. And now on April 14th, 1956, the couple welcomed their first baby, a son carrying Hank's name, Henry Dixon Taylor III. They were new parents trying to navigate the unknown. He was so busy studying, he had no time really to be a dad. And I was so naive, I had never had any experience with babies. I didn't know what to do. And the landlady in that old house we lived in, Mrs. McCracken, she said to me, most important thing is not to spoil this child. She says, if he cries, just let him cry. That was a not, if I could go back, I think, and redo anything, it would be to hold that child. I let him cry and cry and cry because I didn't want to spoil him. That was a bad mistake. We really didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> a year later, Hank graduated from Harvard with multiple job opportunities out west. One job offer was in Los Angeles, one was in Longview, Washington, and one was in San Francisco. And, and, and Hewlett Packard at that time was just a tiny little company. And so decided to take the offer in the little company and see if it would, see if it would grow. And uh, so we uh, set out for Palo Alto and after visiting our families, we, we drove into Palo Alto and it was, uh, it was July. The couple says their first impression of the town left much to be desired. They hadn't invented cal catalytic converters in those days, and so the air was basically brown, uh, yeah. smoggy. Very bad. And uh, the sun was hot, and uh, the lawns were dry somewhat in Palo Alto. So when we drove in, uh, we, we looked at the, the hot, dry weather and the, the uh, uh, bad air and said, you know, why is Palo Alto a great place? Yeah. Call it said, is this it? Is this as good as it gets? <laughs> Hank worked in the cost accounting department at Hewlett Packard. It was a great learning experience and a good place to start. He soon switched gears though. I went then into information systems area, which is sort of like being an internal consultant to the company. And that was fun because I did a lot of different jobs over the years and went from uh, cost accounting to uh, industrial engineering to purchasing to being the controller of a division. While Hank was busy at HP, Colette was all in on the home front. Our eight children came in 13 years. They were mostly between 18 months and two years apart. and. Uh, it was hard. I mean, when they're little, it's a full-time physical drain. And she quickly realized each child is different. They come fully imbued with a personality and certain gifts and likes and dislikes. And it's the same from the very beginning. Really within six months, you detect that this is a real adult spirit and it's, it is its own person. And uh, 
you really, after several children, you see these differences emerge very early in life. Their first child, Dixon, was a good example of this. From the time he was very little, he was very particular about things being orderly. He liked things like this, structured. He's now an orthodontist. <laughs> he was one that would line up his Halloween candy according to size and put it in a shoebox. He took all my tools that were scattered around the garage and he got a pegboard and then he painted the outline of each tool on the pegboard so and it put, would be in put order. pins there to hang it on. So it was all, all there. And, and the other kids were kind of, well, you know, I'll take this and leave it in the yard and it, yeah. uh, uh, drive Dixon nuts. And he uh -huh. liked to have it orderly and ready and accessible. A few months after their move to Palo Alto, Hank and Colette welcomed their second son, Thomas Green Taylor, on September 10th, 1957. From the minute he was born, he would play jokes. I, when I would try to nurse him as a baby, he would bite me and laugh. I mean, he had a sense of humor that was out of this world. When, he, when he'd bite her, he'd just smile and yeah. grin, like uh, I so got lighter. So he had this that. amazing sense of humor. And then as he began to grow up, he loved garbage. Uh, he, he, one of his early jobs as a child was to take garbage out he would bring it back in and say, I can make something out of this. Right. And as he grew up, he found ways with this art studio is typical as he grew up. He always took things nobody wanted and created things out of them. Right now, he owns all these old uh, buildings in Provo that people would have basically gotten rid of that he's taken and turned them into something amazing. He was creative. He could see possibilities in everything. So that was so totally different. Two and a half years later, their third child, Bradford Green Taylor, came to their family on April 8th, 1960. From the minute he was this age, any kind of a ball that came within his purview, he would light up and wanted his hands on any kind of a ball that existed. So he ended up being like a quarterback, a soccer player. Uh, every, he played every sport broke a bone in every sport. He was a pitcher on the baseball team. You know, so totally different kind of personality. <clears throat> Very much people oriented. He was the life of the team, whatever the team was. Uh, we told all the kids they had to earn their own money for college, either all their own tuition or their room and board. So they always had jobs. <clears throat> but they could earn that however they wanted to. Brad heard that if you were a student body president, you could get a scholarship. And he said, that's better than working. So he ran and got, he was a student body president, so he could get his tuition paid at BYU. The couple had three sons in four years. At this point, no one wanted a girl to join the family more than Hank's mother, Alta. My mother had four boys. She loved her sisters. The, those sisters had a, a great relationship together. She was so unhappy that she didn't have a daughter to kind of share her that same feeling with. And uh, mm -hmm. so we had our first child, and it was a boy. We had our second child, and it was a boy. We had our third child, it was a boy. My mother was getting really antsy at this point. She said, are there never going to be any daughters in my, mm -hmm. in my lifetime? And uh, so when the fourth child was expected, she decided that she would come down personally and supervise. And this was in the day before sonograms. So she you didn't know what you were having. She didn't know what she was having. We didn't know what we were having. So she in Salt Lake bought pink infant seats, some pink blankets, some little dresses. And she came down to Palo Alto about a week before Colette was supposed to be delivered. So she came with arm to welcome a little girl into the family. Yeah. No pressure, no pressure. <laughs> and uh, so it, uh, she has a cousin who uh, lives here in Atherton. Very fancy, well-to-do, really an upscale. You have to have 25 million to even get a house there. And uh, so anyway, my mother was invited to uh, meet Ver Verona Bowen and uh, be with her cousin and, and visit with some of the upscale ladies. And so she, she was very excited about going to that luncheon that was invited. 
So Colette was invited to go with her to that. Yeah. Well, this was uh, my due date. But I knew how much his mother wanted to go to this lovely place. <clears throat> so I felt it was my duty to go with her. <clears throat> I wore my very finest maternity outfit. It was a, a dress that had kind of a neckline that went like this. So I sort of pinned it to my underclothing uh, so it wouldn't slip. And uh, I wanted to wear heels and hose. Which, so I wore a maternity girdle that had three garters on all sides to hold the stockings up. <clears throat> so I, I was really dressed up and went to the luncheon and it was this beautiful place. We a maid to serve us, you know, it was elegant. And uh, so we had our first course and our second course. Halfway through the main course, I realized having had three children, I knew what it felt like to have second stage labor. And usually you had first stage labor and then you went into the serious I knew all of a sudden, like this, I was in second stage labor and I was about to have a baby any moment. I said to the ladies, excuse me, please. And I got up from the table and I thought, I don't want to disturb this lovely, elegant occasion. I will just find a place where I can be off by myself and give birth. <laughs> I wasn't thinking straight. <clears throat> so I wandered down the hallway and I looked in every room. Every room was elegant, beautiful carpeting. I said, I cannot have a baby in any of these rooms. I will make a mess. I'll ruin the carpets. And I thought maybe one of the bathrooms, but I thought, you know, that's not too comfortable. Anyway, I'm not thinking too clearly at this point. I finally came back and announced to the ladies, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I'm about to have a child. And they freaked out. These were all older women and they didn't know what to do. And one of them said, you know, I've got a car, but I don't know where the hospital is. And one of them says, I know where the hospital is, but I didn't bring a car. Anyway, they finally pooled their resources and we finally got into a car. One, three ladies, his mother, and two other ladies, one driving, the other one saying where to go. And I'm in the back seat about to have this child. And it, it was very scary. And my, we, my mother is saying, don't push, Colette, don't yeah, push. Hey, don't, don't try, don't try. Anyway, we did barely make it, just barely in time and I, I gave birth to my daughter really essentially still dressed with heels and hose on because they couldn't figure out how to undo everything you know they finally just uh, cut away a few clothes and the daughter arrived and the lady who'd hosted the luncheon was frantic she called Hank at HP and she just said dear boy your wife has had quite a time you'd better come to the hospital <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I didn't know if she died or whether was she's uh, having problems or whatever. So I hurried over to the hospital and found out that we had a baby girl. So anyway, the first daughter was a very memorable occasion. <laughs> and my mother felt personally responsible. Needless to say, Alta got her girl. Amy Taylor came in dramatic fashion, joining her parents and three brothers on September 22nd, 1961. Hank says as the first girl, she had to hold her own. And she was so frustrated that she, at, at the dinner table, she couldn't get a word in edgewise because the boys were all talking and, and just kind of shut her up. And finally, she got to the point where she could talk and hold her own. She got a little bit older and a little bit bigger, and she's never stopped. She's just as a, a good talker, describer, and uh, Good leader. South had amazing math skills. She became a, a great math teacher at the Wasatch School. She taught the advanced students and was just an amazing teacher and tutor of, of math. With four young kids at home, Hank and Colette knew they needed more space. In 1963, the couple started building their home at 745 Christine Drive. The lot and construction cost $42,000 was perfect. Little League Park was right there. The elementary school was right there. The junior high was right there. The high school. The kids could get everywhere by walking or biking. It was perfect. They would go on to raise their family in this home. And 57 years later, they still live here today. The family moved in just months before welcoming their fifth child, George Green Taylor, on June 3, 1964. Hank says George has a big heart. He is amazing at helping people. 
While he was in high school, he worked in the snack bar where kids could pick up snacks and also they could buy their lunch. And there was a little handicapped boy who, who came in every day and he'd say, Hello, George. He said, I want a tuna fish sandwich and a glass of milk, a dollar ten. <laughs> and so the little kid would put the dollar ten on and George would give him the sandwich and the, and the glass of milk. And uh, the prices went up one day. And the, the little kid would still come <clears throat> by and say, Hey, George. A glass of milk and, and a sandwich, a dollar ten, and and George, out of his own pocket, put in the difference for a year. And George used his math skills to become a, a great engineer. I think his approach to life is is uh, methodical and well thought out, and uh, he he just has a great capacity to do hard things. Eighteen months later, the sixth Taylor child, Nicole joined the family on November 22nd, 1965. She is the most thoughtful, sweet person in the whole entire family. She will write these beautiful, wonderful, thoughtful letters and notes. She's a great people person. Right now, when she's home from being a flight attendant, she just puts out on the internet, I'm gonna lead a hike into the mountains, be here at 10 o'clock. All these women come and she takes them on hikes all through the Wasatch Mountains. She knows everywhere to go. They, in the winter, they go snowshoeing. In the summer, they hike. Uh, she does amazing things. Next up, Brigham Green joined Team Taylor on April 8, 1967, on his brother Brad's birthday. Two brothers born on the same day, seven years apart. Colette, who always tried to make birthdays special, remembers decorating Brad's cake just before delivering Brigham. And I remember the theme of that birthday because it was Snoopy and I had made Snoopy's doghouse as the birthday cake. And I remember the last thing to do here was the, the roof of the cake was to put lying down Snoopy up on top. So as we were leaving for the hospital, I remember putting Snoopy on top of the cake. Hank says Brigham's love for movies started at a very young age. One time, older brother Tom took Brigham to see Planet of the Apes and it left an impression. So he sat through the Planet of the Apes, he had them all in his head and just really clear. He came home from the movie and I found him out across the street. There was a series of about 10 trees that had been planted by the neighbors who were, who were there. It was, at the time, it was behind the church fence and so there were no homes there. And uh, I found Brigham out there, went to find him for, for dinner and he was swinging through the trees from tree to tree and he had become an ape, basically. And uh, I, I think that his uh, love of movies and, and the way that he really got into them on a very personal basis was a, a good indicator of his direction in life and it, was, it has been very positive for him. Two years after Brigham was born, the last Taylor child, Megan, was born on April 5th, 1969. Colette says as the youngest of eight, Megan has been a problem solver from the beginning. She just solved problems and she's still that way. We visited her recently, she's in North Carolina. She is now running almost single-handedly with a friend, a 10-acre nursery, and they do the design work. She's ordering all of the things so they can display the flowers and plants in an artistic way and turn this into a, a major industry in that area. <laughs> and she just can do almost anything. She was in a championship tennis team. and Anyway, she does incredible things, but growing up, she just seemed kind of laid back and just uh, whatever needed to be done, she figured out on her own how to do it, how to solve problems. Eight children in 13 years. The crew was complete. Hank and Colette were their fearless leaders with a pretty funny nickname. Comes from a TV show in the old days. Dan Aykroyd and a group in, on TV, they were the, the they had these tall, um, it was a fa family of aliens, but uh, aluminum yeah. foil things, and it was a family of robots. And and uh, Dan Aykroyd and the woman the, were they called weren't the robots. They, they were weren't they aliens? From, uh, Maybe they were aliens. So anyway, it's a show our kids watched, and and the mom and dad in the show were the, were the units, and uh -huh. so so they were they were sort of funny, strange people from outer space. <laughs> and, and then the kids were kind of growing up in a regular U.S. environment. 
And, and so the parents were called the units by the children, and so we were the units. Hank and Colette soon realized that raising their eight children without extended family nearby wasn't going to cut it. They wanted their children to have connections with other loved ones the way they did growing up. So they created that environment. We realized that among several of our really good friends were in the very same situation. So we talked to, with them and said, uh, how would you feel about uh, getting together and creating a pseudo extended family so that all of our kids can be like cousins and you all can be aunts and uncles so that they will have more um, role models than just us. So these people could be adult role models that we felt really good about. And uh, so we thought this would be great for all of us and our kids were of such compatible ages. So we formalized it and we called it the five family group and we actually planned it so that every month one of the families hosted a major event like if it was Halloween we'd all get together and create a spook alley or one had everybody for Olympic competition at a pool uh, you know different things that was sort of a major get together and then little things in between uh, we actually went together with a few other families and purchased property in Santa Cruz Mountains so that there'd be a place we could all go and camp on the weekend. Anyway, it developed it. But the other thing that was amazing as I think about it is that we ended up having just the adults get together once a month to talk as adults about parenting opportunities. How can we do things with just one child at a time? Things like that. And they were all amazing people. I think we learned a lot from each other. They all had incredible ideas and incredible skills. So it was really, I think, a school for parenting as I look back on it. It was yeah. an amazing thing. And our kids did grow up feeling like those kids were all cousins. To this day, they feel close to them. When something good or bad happens to any of them, they all uh, commiserate or congratulate. Hank and Colette thought it important for each child to feel successful at something. So they wanted their kids to try a lot of different things. They told each child they needed to play a musical instrument, play a sport, get a job when they were able to start earning money, and participate in every church activity offered. What we thought is if they chose any musical instrument, they at least would learn to read music. And that can channel into many things. If you're in any sport, you learn teamwork. You learn to be a member of a team and to be responsible to other kids. Uh, working, you really learn to work and the, the value of work. And through all the church associations, you become part of a group of good kids that have parents that are trying to do their best with their kids. So it's an optimum situation for friendship development. Anyway, we just thought by launching them in these different areas, along the way, they would figure out who they were, what they did best, what gave them feelings of competence, and being able to do things. And that they would gravitate from one thing to another, but that was okay, at least they were doing something. And hopefully that would lead to, uh, to good things somewhere, sometime. And I think that, that was really true. Um, I think they did all learn to feel like they were competent at at least one thing. And if you feel competent with one thing, you're willing to try other things. So that was kind of the basic premise. The Taylors especially wanted their children to learn the value of hard work from a young age. They made conscious decisions like not installing a dishwasher or a sprinkler system so the kids would have to help with these kinds of daily chores. There was also a paper route passed down throughout the family. We really felt that it was important that they learn how to save money for, for future activities. And, and so we told them when they were very young that they were gonna to have to pay half of their college education costs. And uh, it, it could be either tuition or it could be your housing, whatever, but half of it's gonna be yours to pay for. And, uh, and so the, the student body president story really comes out of that decision and all, all the kids learn to work and save, save money, and that was a, an important thing, something we wanted them to learn. They also learned a little bit about investment. They were all encouraged to invest, choose some stocks and invest in it. And some, some did well. I think Megan uh, 
made enough money on her investments that it covered for a lot of her schooling costs. He has started Grandpa's Investment Club. As each of the grandchildren gets to be age 12, he gives them $1,000, but they have to have a stock account. Another important part of raising their children was family home evening. Every Monday night, family came first. They would all gather to spend time together. I'd cancel things, he canceled things. So they knew that for us as well as for them, other things had to take second place. And uh, I think that made a difference. I think to this day, they have a camaraderie with one another because growing up, they had to be with each other every Monday. What was funny is they loved to physically wrestle. And uh, Hank would not let me buy a coffee table because they had to have this space for wrestling. The end of the Monday night activity, no matter what else we'd done, always ended up in a wrestling match. And uh, even when they got older, they solved a lot of problems by wrestling, <laughs> physical. But uh, it, it, it was in good spirits by and large, mostly. <laughs> One time Colette <coughs> came into the, to the living room and, and Brigham and Nicole were <coughs> on the floor wrestling and she thought they were going to kill each other and she said, you guys have got to stop this. This is uh, terrible. You guys need to back off. And Brigham, who was just smashing Nicole into the floor, looked up and said, we've got to do this. She's going away to school soon and this is our last chance. <laughs> Let us go. <laughs> so Cola said, okay, and just let them finish their wrestling match. While in the trenches of building a career and a family, Hank served as bishop of the student Stanford ward, then bishop of their family ward, and also served in a stake presidency. A huge time commitment and sacrifice for both he and Colette. It was really, I figured, 21 years when he was up on the stand and I was struggling with kids. And uh, I didn't like that. Yeah, I, I was a little resentful of that because it was hard. Even though it was hard, I felt like what our kids were seeing is an example of a dad who did what he was called to do. And that, that really was the main, main thing, that we were supporting him. We always had a, a joke that his golf clubs collected spider webs, cobwebs in the garage because he gave up a lot just to do family stuff. So um, I think what the kids saw not was a fa an absent father. They saw a father that was there for six days a week and Sunday he was doing his job and that was okay. Colette was a full-time stay-at-home mother while raising her children, the job that never ends. Both she and Hank say they have no regrets about that decision. The world of the 50s, 60s, early 70s is different than now. All of my friends valued their uh, university, that graduate certificate meant a lot. But they were happy to take that certificate, do a few things for a few years, and then become moms. And that was okay. It was not only okay, it was encouraged and in a different way than it is now. This is a different world. I, yeah. I felt my job was to <clears throat> earn enough money that, that Colette didn't have to work and that she could be a, a full-time mom and uh, that, that was a great blessing for our kids to have her basically free to help them manage their lives through school. Colette says having friends experience the ups and downs of motherhood alongside her was invaluable. As the kids were growing up, I had friends. I had a lot of interesting groups that I was with. See, Hank was full-time working, so I sort of had to create my own life. And I was lucky because I had a lot of really good friends. And we had lunch, I had two lunch groups. I had two book club groups. I had a tennis group. I had a poetry group. I did plays and chorus. I had a lot of good friends. I worked with girls camp and a lot of things. So I talked to a lot of other mothers and we compared notes. And over the years, I began to feel like we were all kind of in the same boat. And we all kind of felt like we probably were not doing a very good job but um, I, I think it helped just to talk to other people. Yeah, helps you survive through it. Colette and Hank's parenting journey continued even after their eight children left the nest. Colette was directing the play King and I and looking for the perfect candidate to fill the starring role. 
And I thought, this is it. He should be the king. But I didn't even know him. <clears throat> but I asked him, I said, how would you like to be in a play? He'd never been in a play. He'd never sung, he'd never danced, he'd never done anything like that. But he said, okay, do I have to shave my head? He'd already heard about this possibility. It went through the grapevine. He'd already heard that maybe he would be the king. And anyway, it was really interesting because it became obvious he was very gifted. He learned how to do, uh, to be an actor and a dancer and a singer and a very authoritative king. He was amazing. And he was only 14. Uh, later on, when people saw the play, they thought he was like 21. <clears throat> anyway, in the middle of rehearsals, we found out that he was being kicked out of his foster home and he would be gone. And uh, I sort of had this inspiration that we should take him. I said to Hank, how would you feel about having Tim come into the family? And he said, okay. <laughs> so that's what happened. In June 1993, Timothy Scott Schmalbeck joined the family forever. There was a steep learning curve to join the Taylors and move from a life of uncertainty to predictability. Without even realizing it, I think we came to understand we knew stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so essentially what we set out to do was to, in two years, create for Tim some of the experience that we had given to our eight kids in 18 years. Uh, and the fact that we believed it was possible is kind of interesting. <laughs> Poor Tim had to drink from a fire hose, essentially, because he, <laughs> in a couple of years, he got the whole dose. Love was the key ingredient to success. With love, expectations, and hard work, Tim was the first member of his family to graduate from high school. When he felt like he was now actually a part of the family and was loved and accepted, then everything we did began to be something he was willing to do and, and give it a shot. And uh, I, I think it was really interesting to see him develop um, the security. But it made me realize I had loved the experience of being a mother. I realized that I could really offer to Tim the same kinds of things that we had offered to our kids. Experiences and, and just love. Tim was a very teachable young man. He was uh, someone who learned quickly and was willing to consider ideas that he hadn't considered before. He was uh, in some ways easy to work with because he was not recalcitrant. Uh, the uh, the state paid us, we, we're formal foster parents, and so the state has payments to foster parents. It w wasn't a whole lot, but it was a few. Something few like. A few dollars. 400 a month or something like something. that. Something. So I said, Tim, I'm going to have this go into a fund, and you're going to have to invest it. So he actually every month had to look at his uh, portfolio and, and decide on stocks to buy and, and uh, that basically saw him through school in, in addition to some scholarships that he got and, and uh, it also helped him buy his first home in Idaho Falls. He was willing to listen and, and able to uh, take advantage of the things that need to be done and that was, uh, was great. When we have our family reunions, he comes with his seven children. In the summer of 1997, at age 66, Hank retired from HP, 40 years after he began his career with the company. I had really enjoyed my work very much. All the projects I'd been able to do for Hewlett Packard had been just lo lots of fun, lo lots of challenges, and, uh, but e each one had been rewarding in, it, in its own way. Uh, I'd gotten to the point where I had uh, kind of reached uh, a milestone, in effect, in, in my last job. It was uh, organizing the telecommunications activity of, of the company. And uh, that had gone successfully, and I felt good about the time of departure. Hank's career advice? The key to success is to prepare yourself for something that will allow you to support your family. And then wherever you are, whoever you're working with, 
really try to do something that contributes to that company's advancement. And if you can do that wherever you are, I think it makes a huge difference to how you feel about yourself, about the contribution you've made to that company, and uh, the, the success of your ability to move to, to other things. Life did not slow down after retiring from HP. Less than two years later, Hank and Colette were called to be mission presidents in the Nashville, Tennessee mission from July 1999 to July 2002. Thomas S. Monson set Hank and Colette apart in his Salt Lake City office. Our first indication that we had a, a call to be a mission president was uh, we, we, we'd gotten back from a ski trip with our friends and uh, Elder Haight, a member of the Twelve, uh, called us and said, where have you been? And it turned out that we had messages left everywhere. All, all of our kids and, uh, had messages that you need to call Elder Haight. And uh, so we called him and he said, where have you been? He said, we've, we've been skiing with friends. And he said, you better tell people where you're going after this. No one knew how to find you. And he said, I'm overdrawn at the bank. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, I already put your name into the Quorum of Twelve before I could talk to you. But he said, I put you in for mission president. Would you accept that calling? And we said yes, and Colette said yes. And so we, well, we, we knew that we would be going to an English-speaking mission, but we didn't know where at that time. The young missionaries are just the greatest kids in the world, but they're still young people. They still have some growing up to do, some maturing to do. It's sort of a transition time for a lot of them. So that was that part was fun. Uh, some parts were a little bit stressful, and I remember coming home one night, and Colette was on the middle of a big king-size bed crying. <laughs> and I said, What's the matter? And she well, said, Well, this was after one week yeah. where we'd had significant difficulties. <laughs> Too and numerous to mention. It was a crazy first week. I said, What's the matter? And she said, I want to go home. I, <laughs> yeah. I said, You don't have a home anymore. Tom was living in our home, and we'd made arrangements for everything to be covered, and she had no specific place to return to. So that wasn't very comforting, but that was the, the comfort that she got. Things got better. <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, af after one week, one difficult week, uh, she kind of got her feet on the ground and all was well. She was a great mission president's wife because she uh, would organize choruses for all the zone meetings and uh, had musical numbers and had the kids doing stuff. We had mission gatherings and uh, fun, fun things to do and she, she's the champion of that. For Colette, serving alongside Hank was an inspiring place to be as they ministered to the one and changed lives. It was amazing. He was a great counselor because every time you went to a zone conference, he would interview each one individually and give them good counsel. And all, he really changed lives. It was really very difficult. And I saw him handle all these many difficulties, giving good advice. One, <clears throat> one that really struck me as particularly Solomon-like. We had one young man who had been in Chile on a mission, and he had told his mission president that he couldn't see very well and he needed to go home. Uh, but the church sent him to us. And then he told us that he had s several physical problems. He really needed to go home to take care of these problems. Turned out he really wanted to go home because he had a girlfriend that wanted him to come home. So he told President Taylor that it was really important for him to go home. And Hank said, that's okay. If that's what you need to do, that I will have you go home. But come in to my office, and before you go, I want you to sit down here at my desk and write a letter. And missionary said, who to? He said, I want you to write a letter to your future son, explaining to him why you didn't finish your mission. He stayed. And he became a, a really good missionary. But he had never thought about himself as the head of a family and what that would mean. And he really had to do some serious thinking about what he wanted to become because of that assignment. 
I thought that was masterful. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, he had a lot of good counseling experiences where uh, he made lives different, better. It, it turned out, it was rewarding a uh, number of years later, probably 15 years later, uh, I, I met up with him and he, he said, thank you, you saved my life. And I said, what happened to the girl that, that you left? Is that the one that you married? He said, no. He said, that would have been the worst thing in, the, in my life if I had married that girl. So he married a sweet woman and, and uh, they had three. Five, they got five kids now. Five kids. Yeah. Yep. So that, that was rewarding to see that life had been good to him. Hank and Colette continue counseling younger generations even after their mission. They often spend time and give advice to their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. When it comes to the topics of dating and marriage, Hank has created a list of criteria one should study and examine before getting married. In terms of choosing a mate, there's, there's probably four things that I think are critical. One is that uh, they choose someone who is uh, compatible in terms of their life objectives and their, their goals in life need, need to be somewhat in common. And I think if they're, if they're both members of, of the church, I think that sets a big, broad platform for, for common goals and it makes life really good. Uh, second thing is that it, it's important that they have friends of the same sex. Uh, the person they're looking at. Yeah, I, I think that, that that really tells you something about whether they are acceptable to people who know them well. And, uh, and so that, I think that's a, a key thing. The third thing is that um, when you marry someone, you don't just marry them, you marry their family. And you really ought to check the family out. And the, the girl that you're marrying is gonna be a lot like her father, uh, uh, carry his, some of his biases and characteristics, and be a lot like her mother. And uh, same, same thing looking at a fellow, that he'll, he'll be a lot like his family. And then besides that, you're going to have a long-term relationship with them. So that, that is really a key thing. And the last key element of the four is have a sense of humor, because that helps you get through a lot of things in life that you otherwise wouldn't get through. Both Hank and Colette know the value of a strong family foundation and have proactively created environments of mentorship and love, especially with their grandchildren. One example of this is Kids Camp, hosted by Grandma Colette and Grandpa Hank, a tradition that was founded back in 1995 when their oldest grandchildren were about 10 years old. So we started a grandkids camp, we took him to Pajaro Dunes for four days, and just uh, played tennis, played on the beach, played card games, and just kind of got to know them. And it was a different kind of experience because kids away from their parents, are, they'll do whatever you tell them. That has been amazing. And I think that way the kids have grown together, set examples for each other, and become really good friends. And that's helped them, I think, to have that connection. A couple of them, actually started studying harder in school, said, I noticed that my, my cousins are being accepted at BYU, who, where it takes good grades. And so I'm going to get in like they did. I've got to start studying. So they, they did. And uh, in the process of serving missions and so forth, that example of, of them being together and being close friends has really been an amazing incentive to, to do the, make the right choices. It's been a good thing. Along with family, their faith has been a guiding principle in their lives. I think that the process of, of serving others in the church gives you a focus and a kind of a confirmation from the Lord that you're, you're doing good things. So that process of, of helping others and teaching others and so forth is has really been very helpful all, <clears throat> all through my life. And uh, the opportunity to serve in many different callings in the church, I, th I think is a mainstay in terms of keeping faith. The other, the other thing is, is just the process of 
personal prayer and talking to the Lord and telling Him what, what your problems are, what the needs are, and, and getting what I feel are very direct answers uh, to those, those prayers has been uh, a good thing. And then uh, the third thing that has really been faith promoting, I think for all of the family, is, is just the knowledge that there is a spirit in every human that is independent of the body, and, and you can know that. As you see children grow, you see that spirit more clearly as they grow up, and that spirit stays with them all the way. I guess the other thing that really sustains my faith is, is, the, is just the world around us. The, the Earth is such a beautiful place, and it's so unusual. When you look at other planets and you look at some of the things that uh, are missing, uh, just the fact that there's water in this and the, the axis of the Earth is tilted so that we get seasons and the, the, uh, the sun provides just the perfect amount of heat and light and energy for the Earth to survive. And we have oxygen, we have water on the Earth. And, just, and other planets just don't have that. You just have the clear feeling that this place was prepared for us. And I'm grateful to, to have that. Hank and Colette's lives have not been free of hardship or pain. But when challenges arise, they remember to take 10 steps, then breathe. A motto Hank learned from his father. Many, many times when I felt like the obstacles were, were beyond my reach or, or an assignment to, to take that uh, I wasn't sure I could fulfill. And uh, whatever the task is, it, it just when it seems insurmountable and you just can't quite get a grip on the whole thing or you're not sure you can be successful. I found that the best thing to do is, is just to get started. Even, even a difficult, complex problem, you can find some little place where you can get started. And when you get started, you just go out a little bit further and go a little bit further and, and eventually, that, that's the 10 steps process. It's just starts, start where you are, do what you can, use the skills that you have, and uh, I, I think that that's probably the way that you work your way through the major problems or, or conflicts of life. 90 years of hard-earned wisdom and life lessons learned. The Taylors say they're just grateful to be along for the ride and to have made an incredible life together, side by side. One of the things I would say is probably the best characteristic for a perfect husband is to have one that is not critical. He's never criticized me. Everything I've ever done, we've had lots of talks about pros and cons of things, but whatever I have done, he has been supportive and has admired what I did and let me know that he was proud of what I did. And I've never had to answer to hear harsh criticism, never not once. And I think that is probably an amazing thing. I think it's very easy for people to be critical of other people, primarily someone you're with all the time. Because you see, so I have many, many flaws that could have been criticized. Didn't get it, which I think is a miracle. So he's a miracle person, so be that patient. Yeah. I, I th think, uh, from my side, uh, s some people just uh, go through life and they, they stumble into the things that are fun, and, and with that. But Colette is someone who thinks about how, what could be fun. One, one time we were going around the room and we were asking what the New Year's resolution was going to be. Everyone had, oh, I'm going to clean out the garage this year, I'm going to do my family history, I'm going to do... Anyway, all these burdensome things that had been plaguing them for years came to Colette. She said, I'm going to have fun every day. <laughs> so we kept track for a year. And she not only had fun every day, she had about five fun things every day that, that she did. The, the good thing is, though, that, that lots of things are fun for her. So uh, doing a family newsletter is fun for her, not a burden. And uh, she loves to do art, and she's happy to direct a musical. And so 
there are lots of things that are fun. And, uh, but she has something fun every day. If, if you want a fun life, why well, you get with Colette. <laughs>